Oh, well, it does have... Ah. Bonjour. Bonjour. <laughs> we're having a good time up here. How'd you like to join? We were just saying, it is so crowded this morning that we all should have just done this in the Carlton Bar. Yeah. And then we could have all had, you know, like mimosas and things. Good morning. Um, I hope that this will be a very interactive panel um, because we're so anteen this morning and because there's not a lot of you and there's not a lot of us. Um, you could probably get a lot more out of this panel than you planned on. So um, let me ask this question. How many of you are creators of content? That's pretty good. So you're here to get paid for your work? Yes. Okay, so in the age of the internet, um, oh, by the way, I am standing in, you know, we, we really do take our freedom to travel for granted. Yes. And, uh, and I am standing in for Donatella Della Rata this morning because Donatella is uh, trapped in Syria. Yes. Um, and and uh, I remember being trapped in Cannes last year because of the volcano, and we, we do take it for granted. So those of us who are able to travel, we kind of need to be grateful that we are able to do that. And Henry O oh came all the way from Singapore today, or yeah. well, earlier in the week, and he's sufficiently rested. And Henry and I just met yesterday. Um, and jumping into this, I probably know about as much of, about Creative Commons as you do, so that will be really good, uh, because hopefully I will ask your questions. But this is really about creators, um, talent, uh, not being taken advantage of, as happens all the time. Um, especially if we don't believe that what we create is worth something. Exactly. And we just want to get our names out there, so we'll just give it away for free, you know, growth before revenue. Sure. We'll give it away for free. What does the Creative Commons license mean to people who are creating content? Okay, first, uh, can you load up the slide, please? Um, and uh, second, how many people have heard of Creative Commons before? Okay, so fairly a uh, good number of you. Um, so, what is Creative Commons? Can we load up the oh, slide? On the slides. <laughs> okay, so what is Creative Commons? So, in traditional uh, law, before Creative Commons came about at the beginning of the 21st century, it sounds so old, right? It does. 21st century, you had copyright and you had public domain. And if anybody has a Kindle or an iPad, you're better than thinking from public domain stuff all the time when you read the classics. You know, you can download them. You have copyright, which is quite restrictive. And it actually disincentivizes sharing, because if you allow things to be shared and you don't take action, you're, there's various uh, legal rules to kind of prohibit you from suing later on, right? So if you're a creator of content and you know your content's being shared, you don't take legal action, you are actually prohibited from enforcing your rights later. Wait, so if I distribute copyrighted material yeah. and I market as copywritten material yeah. and I let it go out there for free, yeah and I don't enforce my copyright, yeah. I lose the right to enforce yes, my copyright? Yes, it's called collateral estoppel. So it's like trademark law. Like if you, like Did you go to law school? I go into law school. Oh, yes. well, there you go. So okay. like, uh, it's like Kleenex. Uh, they, don't, they go after shows that use Kleenex as a kind of pronoun for tissue, right? So like Xerox makes everybody say photocopy, not Xerox, because if it becomes common usage, you lose rights to it, right? So this is a problem in the wow. traditional law. So, Creative Commons came about uh, through the work of a professor at MIT named Hal Albertson and a professor at Harvard Law School, Lawrence Lessig. Um, and basically, Creative Commons allows you to license things under a different format so that you have a middle ground between restrictive and completely open. So that you could, as an author and content creator, you can determine, I want just attribution, I want it only for non-commercial use, I want share alike. Okay, example. I've written a book. Yeah. I'm going to distribute that book as an e-book. Yeah. Um, I might charge for it, but someone might be able to grab that file. I really, you want as many people to see your work if you're a new author as possible. I still mark it as copywritten, yes. Yes. It still has copyright, but the way that you license it to the public, right? So there's a couple of authors, like Cory Doctorow, who wrote his uh, famous tech blog, Boing Boing. Um, and there's also Lawrence Lessig, who writes books uh, about Creative Commons. They release their books as ebooks under Creative Commons, under like a buy um, SA or buy NCSA license, so that you can share it, but you can't make money off it. You, I can't say, give me five dollars and I'll put it on a USB stick and I'll stick it into your computer. Okay. Right. So, I, is this clear or am I the only one confused? <laughs> Just kidding. Um, <laughs> so, he, you, I, I have my copyright and I now publish under the Creative Commons license. Yes. 
What advantage does that give me? Give me the five reasons why I should publish it under. Okay, so one, uh, on a larger scale, you have access to community, because Creative Commons does have a very large active community glo globally, so it can have a marketing advantage. Another thing is it's, it's built on a system of jurisprudence and regulation that's been tested by a lot of legal minds. So you, as a content creator, don't have to get, hire a lawyer and get really, you know, uh, technical. Yes, I, I did notice there is actually a Creative Commons license agreement yes. that goes with that you sign when you give your material over, correct? Well, when you publish something on your Creative Commons, you have a Creative Commons license that attaches to that work and it usually links to that work, right? So you can read the legal license by clicking on the link. And everybody who who is going to use this content because it's under Creative Commons. Essentially, if I, even if I don't buy the content and the content's made available for free but it's protected under Creative Commons, I, I am protected by that license and those people that are reading that content agree to that license as yes. well? Yes. So by virtue of using the content under Creative Commons, I as a consumer am agreeing essentially to the content, I won't say security, but the protection, the rights of the content. Sure. So it's like if you go to Wikipedia, for instance, Wikipedia is under uh, by NCSA. It's under a by license, um, a Creative Commons license. So uh, Wikipedia, you go on there, you have access to the information, whatever. But if you were to clone that site and you know, make people log in, pay, subscribe, that'd be a violation of the licensing terms. Okay, so if on Wikipedia I'm grabbing, um, say, you know, um, one of our audience is a, a graphic artist, mm -hmm. and um, they are an example of postmodern graphics, and I decide I'm going to use that in a study that I'm doing, and I'm basically clicking, I'm right clicking, I'm saving the picture. Mm -hmm. Do I have to attribute that artist? I mean, is, yeah, the, is yes. am I on the honor code for attribution? Yes, or? you're on the honor code for okay. attribution. If it was licensed under a buy, which is an attribution license, which is the bare minimum, um, then you would have to attribute that person. And if you don't, then you're technically violating it. Okay, other advantages. So we've got the jurisprudence. We don't have to pay a lawyer. Yeah. We've got access to the community of how many? Would um, you say? It's uh, like it ported into 50 different countries, 55 different countries. Um, and uh, it probably has a few million hardcore members. Okay, great. Third advantage? Uh, third advantage. So this is where uh, the founder of Creative Commons talks about Creative Commons as a stack, as a regulatory layer, is that it makes it simpler to transact and license so that you reduce the friction costs. So it makes it easier to get business done. So for example, if, I wanted, if I'm a, a content creator and there's a piece of music that I want to use in my film, Right now, without Creative Commons, I've got to go find the publisher. Yeah. I've got to negotiate with the publisher, and basically I'm probably stuck, and they'll probably say, well, this is going to cost you $12,000 yeah. a minute to use this, and I won't be able to use that music. Sure. But I might be able to find music of similar mood and style that's under the Creative Commons, even though it wasn't a big hit, right? Yeah. Yeah. So uh, we were talking earlier, and he mentioned that he was working on a project that used Creative Commons music, right? So yeah. I don't know if you all know. Um, if you've heard of Tim Krink's Conspiracy for Good, but if you want to do good in the world, you should probably go to the site and not become a member because it's a conspiracy, so you deny membership. But um, we worked with Indaba mm -hmm. Music, and we uh, worked under the Creative Commons license for the music and for the art. Mm -hmm. So people, Tim Krink created Heroes. This gave young artists and young songwriters and musicians a chance to have their work displayed in something that was likely to be very visible. As a matter of fact, um, we were only doing a pilot, but we had a million casual downloads of the mobile game that led you into the world. Um, and so these people got to publish their music, I guess, under Creative Commons. And that was the first I'd ever heard of it. It wasn't my area. I wasn't responsible for legal, but I did see the agreement go by. But the music is great. Yeah. I mean, we got a theme song. We, we, we put it out there for people to do a theme song. That was great. The artwork was great that we got in. And then even more interesting is we let people take our logo under the Creative Commons license mm -hmm. and use it. And they made candy out of the logo and different shirts and different art pieces using. And we weren't charging for it. We just wanted the logo to get out there. So I guess it was that Creative Commons community yeah. that sort of sparked to it and said, okay, we can create, we can get our work seen. Yeah. So that was, yeah, it was pretty amazing. And, and what was great is, you know, when you think of this, uh, people creating work, you go, oh, you know what, it's just, we're just going to get a lot of, like, bad content. But that wasn't true. Yeah. 
it was really talented people and, and really interesting points of view that we were getting from people who wanted to participate. Yeah, and that's why you see this chart with this growth in Creative Commons. It's, uh, you know, there's a lot of people, we now all have devices with our iPhones or HTC Evos that can capture amazing content, you know, um, and where does this all end up? It ends up on your hard drive. Uh, but does, and sometimes it ends up on Flickr. But there's a lot of creativity, and that's what Creative Commons has always been about, is promoting okay, creativity. Okay, so before we get into the, the gold mining aspects yeah. of this, so can we turn up the lights in the house? Is that possible? Because you don't mind seeing us, right? Okay, so I'm asking for someone who has created a work, either video, audio, written, that you've created a work to just raise your hand and volunteer for a little process. Be brave. Oh, come on. Oh, I see you smiling. <laughs> Anyone that's created, be brave. You're, you're, you're sharing your idea under the Creative Commons license. Don't worry. <laughs> We're not stealing it. Because I really want someone, yes, thank you. I really want someone to walk through the process with you. Okay. okay. Yes, can we get him a microphone? Hi. Hi. I am Clement Schema from Milano and um, from Excel branded. It's a um, content branded and content entertainment uh, agency. Benvenuti. Okay. Grazie. So what's your content? Um, well, I produced a um, number of content uh, for several publishers in the last couple of years and uh, documentaries previously and... Uh, okay, so, so pick, a, pick a content idea that you will self-publish, correct? This okay. is yeah, that you would put out yourself. Um, help me? Help you. Uh, if you have an idea, you're producing video, you're producing programming shows. Yes. Documentary, reality. Okay, documentary. Documentary, perfect. Music, music documentaries. For music instance. documentaries. Okay. okay. Let's put, a, let's put a, an example of um, um, a, a travel, a geo music documentaries. Mm, okay. God, that's perfect. Okay, that's perfect. Uh, okay, I, great. I so, first step. I did so. I did I'm produce sorry, a series your, like that. So, <laughs> what was your first name again? I'm Clement. Sorry. Clement. Okay. What's his first step? Okay. Uh, Clement, uh, first step is to determine a budget, right? Uh, how are you going to make this? Uh, and Creative Commons can help in the sense that same way that you, you found Creative Commons helpful, you can reduce the cost of production, right? Because you're able to get access to quality material um, without having to you know, create it yourself. Um, also for footage, you can actually get access to footage uh, that you need to make your documentary without actually having to hire a team to go there, produce on the ground. So there are two sides to this. So first he's saying, say you decided, just, just say we're gonna do Baroque music and there are Baroque groups all over the world, and you're gonna focus on it. You're saying there may be Baroque content and groups that already exist under Creative Commons license that he can assemble for his documentary? Sure. You know, it's, a, it's crowdsourced, you know, people talk about Kickstarter and crowdsourcing, crowdsourcing of footage, you know, um, where you basically put out a call for footage and you get the footage Okay, back. let's go the other way. So Clement now, he's created a one hour documentary mm -hmm. and it's all him. Yeah. And and the topic is Baroque music. Sure. And, and I, have, I have picked up several archive material, of my let's call it footage from, from the Creative Commons. Okay. Oh, great. Well, he's okay. already doing and this. And I understand music as well. Yeah. Okay. So it, I've got my music but and... But if you're going the other way, because we're using you as an example. So now he's used archive footage, but he has created mm -hmm. his own documentary under his name, and he yeah. holds the copyright. Yeah. And there are other people that want his content for something that they're doing similar. He's doing travel. Sure. So he may have a great, great footage of, for lack of a better, Mount Vesuvius, <laughs> you know. And, and his footage is shot in a really unique way. It's on a high, old-fashioned mm -hmm. high eight camera. And, and it's beautiful and people love it. Sure. So now you're saying that his content, which he's created from start, is also available to other people if they're doing something. It could be if you do license under Creative Commons and the initial kind of license of the original source material. Yes, but let me get this straight. You know, once I assemble the thing, you know, and I pick up uh, 
um, uh, parts of the footage, part of the music, mm -hmm. um, uh, Baroque um, groups and stuff, and, and I assemble it. Mm -hmm. Now, and then I have a broadcaster, suppose, mm -hmm. and I, I want to sell it to the broadcaster. What happens then? I mean, how do I share it with, with the people I have taken the, the footage from? So this has been the kind of... Uh, it's a big, great question. It, it's a great question, and that's what I've been trying to work on for the past few years, is try to create monetization models around Creative Commons licenses, because one barrier for their adoption and implementation is a lack of a business model and business use cases. With YouTube, MySpace, content creators know if my video goes viral and I get a lot of hits, I might get a deal from Sony, I might get something from uh, you know, a label. But in terms of content creators on a smaller scale, they don't know. Like, for example, Flickr, you post a, fli post a picture on Flickr, you see it's under a Creative Commons license. But if you were kind of try to legitimately license this photo, let's say you're running an ad agency or you wanted to use it in a, in a short clip, you would have to track down the author. There'd be high transaction costs. So most people just pirate, right? Uh, that's why piracy often exists, is because you have content creators you have consumers, but when the model breaks down, you result in piracy. When people don't feel like it's worth it, they pirate because it's easier. So you see like videos that go viral, you know, Charlie bit my finger, 235 million views. Um, you know, what 10% of the people produce content, 90% of the people consume. But with these devices that are coming online, uh, we think, I believe that it's going to be more, more balanced and you're going to lead to this culture of remixing. So like what you do when you said you assembled this content, you're kind of remixing in a way. You know? And people ask me, oh, how, how common is remixing? And I said, well, I know someone who has postcards from different parts of the world, old, unique ones, and she frames them. right? And uh, she actually asked me the question, I never remix anything. I said, well, but you actually did remix. Like you took some physical In object. the most analog of ways. Yes, <laughs> but that's that kind of fundamental human drive, right? is to kind of alter things to make it how we want them to be. And the traditional copyright system kind of criminalized this in many ways for young people. You know, like our, my, my younger right. nephew grows up in this culture where they just take, right? And all of a sudden their parents sometimes get slapped with these like letters from the RIA saying you owe $50,000, you know? Uh, because you've been sharing all this music and the parent freaks out. And so this is, this is a solution to that because if my understanding is correct, yeah. Um, Clement? No, Henry. <laughs> Henry's system um, is now going to allow those people to get paid. Yes, so that's, that's the so goal. So this is to be? This is what you're working on? Yes, yes. and he's going to talk about it now, but you, you've been great because you have illustrated the problem in the marketplace, mm -hmm. which, I, which is exactly what I was hoping for. You've illustrated the problem in the, work, in the marketplace that Henry's solution is addressing. And so it, it's, it, it's not a perfect solution, but I think you know, the idea is that with Creative Commons, it's so new, and digital convergence and all these other buzzwords, you need experimentation with business models. Because right now you see traditional media, and they're trying to adapt to technologies, and people talk about multi-platform licensing, and it just gets more and more complicated. More money gets thrown at the problem, and it's a constant you know, a battle. And it's not really an evolution in business models. Like you look at you know, online papers versus offline. I mean, subscription models are basically old business well, models. What you what you have in in what Henry's developed is a, a kind of pioneer marketplace. Yes. Because when you put your content out there, you really, as a new content creator, if you don't have a name in the business, you, you know, it's not like de Kooning that's going to just keep exactly. forgetting. You don't know what your content is worth. So those people that, who you've licensed under the Creative Commons, Henry's system is now going to enable you to pay for that content. Can you explain that? Yeah, so if you have content, you would go to our site and then upload, and you'd see you have these boxes. You allow people to remix, and we try to simplify it. Because even as a lawyer looking at Creative Commons, it can become very confusing what you're allowing people to do. So what we try to do is simplify the licensing and say, do you want to allow people to reuse this without attribution? So you could take a picture, use it, and not attribute so that, you know, for marketing purposes. Um, do you want to allow for commercial use? You know, if so, this price. And it sits on top of a Creative Commons license. So, so you, as the content creator and owner, are determining the rules. Exactly. 
and it's built on top of an existing Creative Commons layer. So you're basically saying, it's a, I, can, I want people to share, to remix, but these are the conditions I have. Attribution, share alike, non-commercial. But if you want to not attribute me, and if you want to use it for commercial use, you can pay me to do so. Right? The other thing that we allow is we want to kind of get into this remix culture, is to allow people to attach source files or premium files. So that if you have a piece of work, like a, you know, a film, it's a edited under uh, Final Cut, you could put up the entire package and say, okay, this 10 minute sequence, here's the MP4 preview um, of the entire thing that's watermarked, but, and you can download it as well with the watermark, but if you want the original Pro Tool, uh, the original Final Cut version so that you can edit it, then it's available under a separate price, right? And another model that you could do, for instance, is recipes. If you put up a photo of a recipe, it's watermarked. You could actually make your premium files like a video instruction of, you know, how you making it, um, you know, something to print out for. So you could essentially lists. assemble a multimedia cookbook. Yes. And you could entice people with the recipe and then charge for the how-to. Exactly. You know, with the photo of, you know, with the photo of and the how-to. Okay. So. Now we're going back. So we're now able to establish the rules as the content creator, yeah. like any digital rights organization yeah. would. So we've established the rules, and I have um, recorded this Italian Baroque group out of Boston, mm -hmm. and, and I'm a big fan of that group, and they have let me photograph mm -hmm. them, and we're going to share in the Creative Commons mm -hmm. fee, but we don't know how much it's worth. Yeah. So we're going to charge Clement, $25, is that a one-time fee? Yes, one-time fee. So there's other sites that have different models where they ask you, is this going to be international, is this going to be national, is this going to be for print, web, everything. Namely the libraries, they all do that. Yeah, um, like, and the, the problem is the harder... It takes you three days to fill it out. Exactly, and so most people won't do it. You know, They'll just say, forget it. And also for the person wanting to license the content, this makes it much simpler for them as well. And Brian asked me a good question the other day. Well, how do you know what price to set it at? And you know, how do you protect people from licensing it for too cheap, for instance? Right. right? Um, and, I, and basically, my response to him then is the same now, is that it's one man's trash is another man's treasure. That's the whole eBay okay. model. So I'm going to tell you what happened with Clement's documentary. Okay. So he bought these clips. Mm -hmm and he aggregated them, mm -hmm. and he paid one person $15, because mm -hmm. that's what they asked for it. The other person, it was a pretty good clip, the sound was great, it was shot in high def, and he was able to use this as a background, as the opening title sequence, whatever, mm -hmm. and, and he paid them $50. Mm -hmm. A year later, mm -hmm. you would not believe it. Folks, Clement won an Oscar for that mm -hmm. documentary. Bless you. And suddenly, that documentary is everywhere. Yes. And I'm sitting in my little one room, very cold apartment with a space heater and saying to myself, man, I sold that cotton at them for $15. Well, I mean, that's like the, the men who invented Superman, right? They ended up almost dying penniless because they had no rights to the character because they were under a work for hire contract. And there was no decent. Creative Commons license at the time. Yeah, but I mean, so. This, so this is not something new to content creators, is you know, creating something of extreme value and not pricing it correctly from the start. Okay, but let's take this to its logical conclusion. Sure. So if he's a kind man, yes. go ahead, Clement. I'm sorry, um, on, on top of what you're saying, uh, I have to credit the, um, the, the, the owners of right. the content. Right, this is where, this is where so, I was going. Yeah, I'm sorry. So I was saying, if he's a kind man, yeah. aside from crediting, yeah. maybe he will go back to them and offer them something. Yes. If not, because of that credit, they can now say, yeah, exactly. I'm an Oscar-winning filmmaker. Sure. That's because right. my, my work has been used in my Oscar work has film. been used in Oscar. So when you're looking for association, you're really you're throwing the dice. Yes. Uh, so I mean, we're geared toward the prosumer market. This growing kind of field of people who capture lots of content, lots of video, usually it doesn't end up anywhere else but on their hard drive, who think maybe I can actually generate some money from this. It's a hobby of mine. I like to take pictures of, you know, scenery or, you know, and, music and like groups, any, world music groups. And like any community and any really good content, it should move up the chain. If you're a really excellent photographer or a videographer or a documentary maker or even a reality television sure person, you, you, the great content should rise to the surface. And as the equity in the brand goes sure. up, 
you you have the freedom to go back in yeah. and charge a different amount for the very same content? You technically could, but we would dis we actually discourage that behavior. Um, what we would hope is that as your content becomes used more and as your name recognition grows more, you actually realize that you should start charging more for your work. So, but by the same token, that same piece of work, if it's a popular photograph, say it was the Farrah Fawcett photograph, sure. and I'm very old, folks, but say it was that pinup model photograph, yeah. and, and you could sell millions and millions yeah. once it catches on at the $10 or $5 fee, so you're going to make your money there, yeah. but your next photograph is worth more, just sure. like if you're an artist, except now you're alive and you can collect the money exactly. rather than dead and not. And there was a famous uh, story that was featured on some of the tech blogs a couple weeks ago of this one man who took an image and had been used in so many advertising campaigns and commercial uses. He had never received any licensing fee except from National Geographic. They were the one out of like 50 publications who had used his image in some way and never actually given him credit or attribution or any money for it at all. Um, and because he had put it on Flickr, right? Um, and someone just right click download, saved as, and forgot could where he, they got from. Okay, could he go back and relicense that under the Creative Commons? Yes, he could. Whereas if you had a copyright on it, you couldn't enforce it. Yeah. But you could re... Yes. Well, that's pretty good. Yes, copy, Creative Commons licenses are irrevocable, but you can, you know, technically you can apply multiple licenses onto a copyright. So if I work. have a piece of content that's been out there for three years and people are starting to catch on, I can suddenly put it under a Creative Commons license and get paid for it up by your system. Yes. Yes, you could. Okay. I want to, because we're talking about music. Yes, Clement. I have a question. Um, is, does this apply? to complete works, or does this apply to fragmentation as well? So I mean, one, one meaning that if I, if I another take... a good question. Yeah, if I take the, um, the footage or the music or whatever, the content, and, and then I have... Um, uh, uh, I, I make up a very be beautiful storytelling and a new piece of work, and then I re-post re it on, mm -hmm. on Creative Commons. I re it on Creative Commons. What happens then? So... Uh, it depends on if that fragment of work, what license it was under, right? Uh, if it was under the most permissive license, just like an attribution license, you give that person credit. Um, and then you're free to license it how you wish. If there's a share alike variant of Creative Commons license that says, if I license it under certain terms, you, if you do anything with it, you have to also license it under the same terms. The same terms as yeah. the original. So that if I do something under like a, you know, attribution non-commercial license, buy NCSA, share alike, and you do something with the work, you also have to relicense it under buy NCSA. Or if I do something under a very permissive license, like attribution only, with the share alike, if you also create something from it, you also have to do it like an attribution share alike, so that you can't put under non-commercial and make it more restrictive. So like open source code licenses in some ways. I understand, and that's for, um, and, and that's for use, reuse, and also for, for fragmentation, Meaning that I can take um, a piece of yes. work and use um, 10 yes. seconds of so it? So that's why we want to kind of encourage the remixing, is that, for example, as a musician, you might just come up with a, a riff of music, right? Um, like a guitar riff, but you can't really figure out the rest of the song, and you don't really have time to. But, you know, you'll, like if you're a famous musician, you might just put out there and say, if you want to take this, remix it, use it for commercial use, $1,000, right? Um, that, that's completely permissible. And you can then listen to it and share it with your friends under Creative Commons, as long as it's not for commercial And use. you can layer in on top of it. You can it layer in on top your, of it. Yeah. Your, your riff, your track. Exactly. Okay, while we're on the subject of music, um, you, we, you would think we've known each other for years, wouldn't you? But just 15 minutes over a ham and cheese sandwich and... Yeah, and here um, we are. You, you talked about um, the music rights organizations around the world, CSAC, ASCAP, and their reaction to the Creative Commons license yeah. and, and to fee-based Creative Commons license. Can you talk about that? Yeah, yeah. So one of the things that I discovered in Europe um, recently is that, so you can see here that how you can you know, purchase to download. Um, but Creative Commons licenses in the US are not incompatible with royalty collecting societies. Um, in Europe, however, unfortunately, there is a problem in the sense that some collecting societies do not allow their members to use Creative Commons licenses. And okay, one so, sec. Does everybody know what a collective society is? A collecting society is uh, an organization that's given uh, rights by statute, usually, 
to collect royalties on behalf of artists and distribute it to those artists. So when a song is on a jukebox yeah. or used in, well, that's a different thing. That's a license. But when it's played on the radio. Yeah. Or T is something documentary shown on TV. So for instance, your example, you create a documentary under Creative Commons. Um, let's say French state television decides to air your documentary. There is probably a, a collecting society that collects royalties on behalf of you. Uh, from the television station for the commercials and other revenue brought in. Now, it, under um, some collecting societies, most of them in Europe, you cannot be a member of that collecting society because you use a Creative Commons license. Therefore, that collecting society will not distribute the royalties to you. And because it won't distribute the royalties to you, after a certain period of time, it has a right to just absorb the royalties into itself. Right? That's a very significant problem for for you know, creators, not just people using Creative Commons, but for creators in general, when you have organizations that will collect royalties on your behalf, but don't distribute Okay, them so let me make this a little bit clearer. So I, I'm the songwriter for your movie, and you have licensed my music under Creative Commons. That music in that movie gets picked up because it's pretty darn good. And suddenly it's on the radio, and people are playing it everywhere, mm -hmm. and other people are using it. And the Performing Rights Society decides that they are going to collect royalties on that. Yeah. But because I have licensed that under the Creative Commons to him, yeah. I'm not going to see any of that money. Exactly. That's what's happening. There's been a few cases in Europe. Um, uh, and uh, there's a person out of the Netherlands, Paul Keller, who's doing a lot of work on this. But it's a huge issue that not a lot of people know about. So but not only am I not going to see it, they're going to keep it. They're going to keep it. You know, a lot of them, if they cannot distribute the royalties to its members, and if you cannot be a member because you've used Creative Commons, after a certain period of time, they just... Well, it seems money. to me that someday someone should say, that's my money yeah. on my work. I'm going to sue you, yeah. Creative right, uh, Performing Rights Organization, for you to pay me what my money is. So you're really you and your uh, creative mix. Creation mix. Creation mix, sorry, his company's creation mix. And CC licensing are really a disruptor yes. because you're enabling the democratization of performing rights. That's what we're trying to do. I mean, that sounds very like noble. But that's and right to the point because what Creative Commons does is uh, um, challenging the, the um, the establishment. The, the exactly. establishment, which is a performing rights societies, yeah. PRS, ASEM, CI, yeah. um, GEMA, and you know they 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 lived forever on that, and the, the new digital era is challenging all yeah. that. Yeah, we w we want to disrupt. I mean, CC in a certain way provides a regulatory framework for disruption that's going on on the technological side as well. I mean, you see convergence in devices. That's why you have to do multi-platform licensing. Wow. But on the licensing side, it's also a disruption in the sense that. You're enabling people to share their content, and you're unlocking creativity. Because this okay. idea that I just want to put this in a greater context, if we can get a little bit philosophical. After one moment, after all, we are in France. Yeah, sure. So, really, whether you look at the use of Twitter and Facebook as an open platform for sharing the revolution, or you look at Creation Mix for sharing the revolution. We're at a place right now where digital has empowered people to express themselves yes. as, they, as they may have always wanted to. Yes. There's a lot of power in the hands of the people. So there is this general disruption that's caused through the democratization of media. Yes. And then in the entrepreneurial spirit, I'm just trying to put this in context. In the entrepreneurial spirit, someone like Henry O comes in and says, well, not only are you able to publish your material under Creative Commons license, but now we're going to take the power out of the hands of the establishment so you can really get your value. Yeah, so that you can make money without going through an intermediary. And the Who reason will take a lot of that money. Yeah, and except that now you're the intermediary. Uh, What's your business model? But so What's your business model? So exactly. What's our business model? We take what we do is we act as a hub for a lot of content services. So we have an API. We have a WordPress MU plugin so that basically you can upload content licensed under Creative Commons and it'll show up both on your site and on our site. Okay, so that went by really fast. So first of all, what are the fees that you take? Because that was my sure. question. So uh, we take 10% capped at $100. So, if so you never take more than $100. You know. So if I charge $5,000 for the only license, yeah. you only take $100. Yeah. Well, that's a pretty good deal. Yeah. 
Um, okay, and you set a plugin for WordPress. WordPress and APIs, okay. so that you can help so an application protocol yeah. interface, which means that if you are working in WordPress or I have my site on WordPress, that I, there is a program, a yeah. plugin that I can use that allows people to click on that to pay the license fee. Yes. Okay. And Do you have your own? It. And to license it. Do you have your own site? So if I don't yes. have a WordPress site and I just want to publish my content to yes. Creation Mix? Yes, you can publish directly to Creation Mix. Okay. So it acts as a hub. You can put your content there, but you can also use whatever site you prefer. Um, use your WordPress blog, put the content there, but you know that if you're generating images for your blog, you can just automatically put them up onto Creation Mix at the same time so that if people want to license it for use, they can. Great. So I, just in its simplest form, I took an absolutely amazing picture last night um, in a, with a black and white filter of a garden mm -hmm. that I think is probably, I'm an amateur photographer, but I think it's probably one of the best pictures I've ever taken. Yeah. So I, if I just put that up on my blog and saying, here I was, I'm not protected. No. So what I need to do is either put it up on your site or put it up, since I have a WordPress blog, mm -hmm. use your plugin. If someone wants to right click that photo and save it, yeah. I mean, I could try and disable that. Yeah. There's obviously a way. But if someone clicks that right photo to save it, they can still do that. Is there a notification? So, there's, so if you'll see on the previous example here, you'll see that it's watermarked, right? So okay. that's, in a very basic sense, a form of protection. Now, people ask, how can you ensure that you know, people can't steal? It, it's a fundamental. Well, I get a better question. Yeah. Because you know, I know your answer to that is a lot of this is going to be based on the honor system and hoping it, that people it's will. A, it's a fundamental view on human nature. But how yeah. are you going to? How is that going to be marketed so that when people recognize that symbol, where they see that symbol, they know there is an action that they should take, or they know that this is protected? So the, those are standardized Creative Commons symbols, uh, the BY and CSA. What it would show up on your WordPress blog site would be some type of license button right by the image where okay. someone would click on that and then license the work. Rather than you know the previous example with Flickr, tracking down the original photographer through username, right. leaving comments saying, hey, please get right. in touch with me. So the idea is to enable the licensing process to be very right. simple. Very simple, very fast. And kind of seamless. Exactly. OK. Um, sir, is your question still relevant? Hold that thought. Yes, hi. Uh, my, my name is Robin. I'm a producer for documentaries in Switzerland. And I think this discussion about music is really, really interesting. So my question is, as you know, we often, we either decide we work with composers or, you know, if you don't have the botches, you work with royalty-free music. As we all know, royalty-free music, it's really hard. There is a big mess in the internet. Sometimes you don't know if it's really royalty-free and if you have to pay certain amount of money to a performing uh, ride society afterwards. For instance, when you produce DVDs in a big quantity. Yeah. So what I would like to know, for example, uh, Peter Example, you know. Peter Example is producing pieces of music and Peter Example is a part of a, a performing ride society. Is it GEMA or Suiza? If he sells his music, or if I license his music through through um, Creative Commons, and then you know I have to when I turn in the, the the documentary, which might be sold worldwide in Switzerland to Suiza, I have to turn in the name and I have to turn in the music pieces. Mm -hmm. So if this guy I licensed uh, the music through uh, through well, um, Creative he's Commons, gonna, he's gonna be do I then still have to pay a certain amount of money for the DVD production, you know, because this is okay, a... Okay, so th let, me, let me cut to the quick. You're asking if you paid him under the creative license fee, now you've turned in your cue sheets and everything for the DVD, and the Performing Rights Society is going to come back and charge you. You've paid twice. Right. Okay. Do I pay a one-time fee, and then I know I'm pretty much out of the game, you know? No, so we don't, we, we would hope that that kind of change would take place. I mean, the licensing system is a mess in general, right, because of this type of problem that you mentioned. What we basically do is act as you would still, under a traditional system, to remove Creative Commons from the equation, you would still have to pay the musician for the work under a traditional scheme, right? What we're basically allowing people to do is share their work under Creative Commons so that you can listen to the MP3 and decide if it's appropriate for your film, and then license it if you want to use it for commercial use, license it, which would just be a commercial license between you 
and a content creator. And then whatever the laws within your country would still apply. We would not take care of that particular problem. Boy, that, I mean, that's a court case. That's a court case. I mean, that is a court case. That, that is probably going to come up because he will have said, look, Peter Example set his music on there. That, yeah. That no, is but I, I mean, that's a, that's a very, I mean, this question, I mean, no matter if it's Switzerland or Germany or whatever, wherever yeah. in Europe, when it comes to reproduce your piece, whatever is a fictional film or documentary wow. yeah. film, when it comes to reproduction as DVDs, I think, I mean, from my point of view, this is a very important question. Because, you know, sometimes when you, when you take royalty-free music, it's really hard to figure out whether this guy is attached to... Well, even aside to, from the royalty-free music, I'm sorry, what was your first name again? Uh, Robin. Robin, I apologize. Um, even put that aside, I don't think that your question is going to be answered until it comes into court. Yeah. I, I don't think there's an answer for it. Because, one, on the one side, the performing rights organization is saying, he can't play and we're going to keep the money. But they're going to get that money from you, but you've already paid him. So that, there Pro isn't an answer. Probably only when a rights, uh, rights body or rights standard organization that has like a, you know, IP in a particular standard and they want to get pushed and there's, a dispute with the collecting societies uh, because you know they want let's say you're releasing a next generation DVD you want people to adopt it but there's these regulatory fees attached to it you might want to bring it in court but as a small time player you're yeah, never going to get the here's the thing change. here's the thing poor robin yeah. now i don't know whether robin has unlimited resources in a swiss bank account yeah um, but poor robin he's going to get sued yeah and he will probably, because he's just like what happened with the recording industry in America, RIAA, because he's a little guy, he's going to end up paying twice because it's not spelled out yet because he can't afford to go to court. Yeah. So I, I, this is really hairy stuff, as we say in California. This is really hairy stuff, as we say in California. And, and this is where the law often lags behind technology. Um, you know, with uh, blank CDs and DVDs, there's act actual additional taxes that are supposed to compensate for piracy that you're paying, but now they want to put additional levies on. Um, so well, spinning media is going away anyway, so yeah, we won't exactly. need to worry about that. I'm sorry, to, uh, yeah, this woman had a question down here. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, I can yes. Sure, sure. Oh, she's on the phone. We have to come back to her. Boy, talk about a digital yes, age. I know, can, I, can I just um, add to the previous to Robin's question? There's the fact that um, the legislation in Europe, at least I know the legislation for Italy, France, uh, Spain, and once that the performing that if you distribute um, in shops or in uh, in kiosks, you know, whatever in home, the home video product, which is the DVD or or the CD, you have to pay um, the royalty to the performing rights society before. Otherwise, you're not allowed to distribute it. Yeah. Well, probably still going to end up in court. I mean, there was uh, a no. You're not getting there. Th there was a case. You're not going to the shop. There was the a shop will not distribute it unless right. You have I the understand, but even e the issue still will remain. So regardless, so so here's the bottom line: you either extend and embrace change, or you are shut out. The music industry in the United States is a complete mess because they didn't understand what was happening. And so everyone in here who's a creator, whether you're a famous artist or you're just starting out, the bottom line is, there's a, and, and I'm gonna sound like a politician, but there's a democratization yeah. that's going on so that people can get their value. And it, it's whether, it doesn't matter whether workers wanna be paid what they're worth in Egypt or someone wants to, to get the money that they deserve for what they create. And for the longest time, without Creative Commons, artists were being ripped off anyway, and they weren't getting what they were worth. And notoriously, in the 50s in the United States, artists weren't being paid for their work. I mean, it is the nature of the ugly, the ugly, ugly underbelly of, of the arts. So the issue still remains, and what I think the point is that you're making is that there are antiquated systems that aren't working, this is coming along, and this is the first step in providing a larger solution. Yes, because Creative Commons started out as a political thing. Uh, a lot of people think of it as technology or media licensing, but 
It came about because of Lessig and Hal Robertson's fears that copyright, as it was evolving in this kind of lockdown age, was stifling democracy and democratic discourse. That everything, because it was protected, was stifling creativity and kind of eroding democracy. You know, to say, well, would Walt Disney have been Walt Disney if he, Snow White was copyright protected, you know, and Cinderella, those stories were copyright protected. And he couldn't make movies out of these uh, old stories. I mean, there would be right. no he Walt couldn't Disney. Have, yeah. You know, and he was basically taking these old stories and adding value to them and, you know, influencing an entire generation of people. And this fear that copyright systems are becoming so locked down because of this fear of piracy that you're going to kind of damage future creativity and democratic discourse. This was underlying creative Well, comments. and not to mention the speed of learning. Yes. Yeah. Um, because people want what they want when they want it. Exactly. And the thing about Wikipedia, the thing about, you know, having a Kindle and being able to download something on the fly or even the Internet Movie Database, you're watching a movie and you want to find out who's on it. We're, we're conditioned right now to know that we, can, that we have an information world on demand and that stuff isn't locked behind a door. And if it is locked behind a door, it's actually reducing... It's actually reducing the revenue possibilities for the stuff that's locked behind the door as well. Sure. So, you know, there's lots of, like, found footage, you know, that might not be valuable to you, but could be of use to someone uh, making a documentary about a subject that you have never thought of. So. Yes. So I have a question that's kind of uh, related to what you just said. And your name is, and you're from? <laughs> My name is Angela Natividad, and I'm actually live blogging for the MIP TV blog. Okay. Hi, Angela. Hello. Uh, so in hacker culture, it's very, you have this very uh, common thread of uh, liberty and protecting democracy, protecting the rights of people not just to remix, but to say what they like without being impeded. And uh, that's something that we've seen uh, not just in hacker culture, but just kind of a spill over into things like what's happening in the Middle East right now. Sure. Uh, somebody told me that Steve Jobs has this idea that, you know, that period where he was uh, fired from Apple, and things kind of went downhill for a while. He has this feeling that um, if that hadn't happened, open systems wouldn't have kind of won and taken over uh, kind of the destiny of technology. It would have been closed systems. And uh, what do you? How do you? What do you think of that? Uh, that's interesting. I, have, I haven't heard of that either. Um, that if he hadn't left Apple, that open systems would not have evolved. Yeah. Um, that would basically mean that like a tag team of Bill Gates and Steve Jobs together could defeat the forces of open <laughs> software. That's well, basically the like question, right? What's happening with Apple now, right? There's you know? this attitude of that. I mean, know, the, like, the who's the Batman and who's Robin in that tag team? Taking everything over. So there's this idea of, well, maybe if I had that 10-year head start. I like, I find I it think hard so, to yeah. think that Steve Jobs by himself could. He can do a lot of things. He, you know, don't get me wrong, but I don't think he could stop open software. Um, you know, uh, here's, here's the basic, I mean, it's an interesting premise. Now, now let me speak as an amateur sociologist in anthropology. People yearn to be free. Yeah. The bottom line is we don't want borders, you know. So if France had dropped off the map for 10 years, would there be no European community? <laughs> would there be no, yeah. you know? Well, some people might think so. Well, I mean, I think, <laughs> in, I think intrinsic human drives are to tinker, to share, and to be cheap, you know. And that's part of being, like, minimum effort, being efficient. And... If you build systems that kind of assume that people aren't going to do the right thing and you try to lock it down and make it even more complicated, it just feeds the beast because people like to cheat the system. They get, you know, some Well, but the other side is closed systems eventually consume themselves. Yes. But do you think there needs to be this kind of tension between closed and open systems? I don't necessarily think in my mind that one is going to Don't you to think it drives another. innovation? In a way, yeah. Yeah. On both sides. Yeah, conflict. You know, it's, it's like armor and weapons, you know, over the years, just innovation. Yeah. You know, the thing is, is that it, because Apple is a closed system, and, and we can talk about Apple for days, but, you know, it's a system that has integrity. I mean, I'll admit I switched over to Apple about almost two years ago, and now I joke that when, when we walk into the Apple store, we have to be quiet because we're going into church because <laughs> I'm such a believer. But I believe in the system because of its integrity, because it works, because they take care of the customer. They are the benevolent dictator. You know, and they give their people on the front lines the opportunity to decide whether you have to pay for the iPhone replacement because yours fell in the toilet or whether they're going to give it to you for free. True story. I wasn't in the bathroom when it fell in the toilet. But the bottom line is that they are forced to innovate, to compete with open systems to keep their customers. And people rely on them for innovation. At the same time, 
there are people on the outside that say, we can do that one better, and the collaborative mind can solve problems just as well as Apple can. Sure, and, and don't forget, Apple uses a lot of open source software in its underlying kernel. So it, they, they're actually an interesting business model or case study of using open uh, tools and systems and building value on top of them. You know? Um, what else do you need to tell us before we take any more general questions? One moment, I just want to make sure that Henry has enough time to finish his, his delivery. Well, I, I think what you were talking about in terms of allowing collaborative efforts. You know, one of the things that we want to enable our system to kind of provide the functionality of collaborative uh, projects, you know, that people can put up sound and snippets of video and people can assemble them together and create new works out of that. I think this is a fundamental part of what's going to be driving human behavior uh, digitally uh, in the next 10 years. You know? Yeah, it's really interesting because it's, it's I, I believe you're right, and I, I believe it will eventually be seamless. Yes. Because we will take this collaboration for granted. Yes. You know, we are now all part of the revolution. Yeah. Um, and we take, even take the revolution for granted. You know, we have GPS that knows where we are. We're much more transparent in, our, in where we are. The value of privacy has changed to the next generation. Yeah. So once the value of, once the privacy walls come down to certain, it allows for that kind of collaboration. So yeah, I believe you're right. Yeah, I mean, and tools are becoming powerful and more accessible. You can teach like a three or four year old can use an iPad, right? And if you give them a little drawing sketchbook program, it, are we really going to make them criminals if they draw over a picture of Mickey Mouse and share it through Facebook? You know, like, yeah. you know, is that really it's what It's really we want? Quite, quite an interesting dilemma for established businesses. Exactly. So, so. This, so part of what we're trying to do is get in the marketplace, disrupt, and get people to think. We might not have the right answer, but at least it stirs up some dust. I saw a hand up. Yes. By the way, thank you. First of all, thank you, Clement, and thank you all for it's the participation of the audience that makes for a great discussion. So it's the collaboration. Yes. Hi, my, uh, my name is uh, Eddie Ruiz. I'm uh, the managing director for uh, the History Channel in Latin America. So I'm not, I'm not a creator. I'm more of a firefighter. I put up fires all day. Okay. And some of the fires I put have to do with Su people suing us for productions or using footage, or which we have an extensive legal department that ensures that we don't get to that mm -hmm. point. But it does happen once in a while. And this is the first time I hear about Creative Commons and reason for being here. I'm looking at it, okay, how, how do we use this as a business mm -hmm. to be able to do better productions, protect our productions, uh, the gentleman sitting next to me is our head of production, and I was wondering, is Creative Commons, do you have to either choose, I copyright this, or I put this under no, Creative Commons? No, it, it's, it's, always crea it's always under copyright, okay? okay. But it, or you can release it under public domain, that's your choice. But Creative right. Commons licenses are just, it's a license, it's okay. not a copyright. So you're basically licensing it for general public. Okay. It's a general public license. The issue that you mentioned about uh, in Europe with uh, the ASCAPs of mm -hmm. the world and so on, is that also pertain to Latin America? It, de it would depend on the particular country, and I'm not well versed enough to, to know in Latin America, but aside from the U.S. and a few other uh, Western countries, it's a pretty endemic problem. Okay, and another basic question is, are you trying to build like a, an association of people that are in, in you utilizing Creative Commons, and is that? Well, he's you know, not. It, it already exists. It already exists. It's, it's so where, is, um, where can people find out yeah, more right, about Creative Commons? So if you want to find more about Creative Commons, you go to creativecommons.org. Um, if you want to learn more about Creation Mix, you go to creationmix.com. Um, and uh, there's a lot of information about Creative Commons on the web. Uh, it's the White House uh, page uses it now. Al Jazeera has some clips uh, of uh, under Creative Commons up on their site. There's a lot of people experimenting with using Creative Commons, and that's what people want to see happen, is people experimenting with how to use this uh, in business models. Okay, thank you. Because the fundamental breakdown in business models is often, how do you share and get attention? Because that's what everybody's seeking, right? We might call them users, we might call them watchers, viewers, ratings, whatever, but ultimately the commodity being sold and paid for is attention. And can, the best way to get attention is to share but the current system doesn't allow for it unless you use something like Creative Commons. Wow. Um, 
I have time for one more question. No one has a question. Okay, so um, what you've got right now, you know, there's a, a really interesting book by Lawrence Bolt, and it's called The Tao of Abundance. And in his book, he wagers that people end up in jobs that they don't want in factory jobs because there's no way for their value mm. as creative people, as artists, as artisans to, to be heard. Mm -hmm. So because they have to make money, they have to survive, they take a factory job when they're really a painter. Sure. So if, is this the answer? Well, I'm hoping that it's part of the answer. I think uh, a lot of those problems, you know, regulatory problems about like dual licensing and dual pay royalty payments, well, all that stuff has to be dealt with, but I'm just hoping to be part of this larger movement. The people that are here and the, the people, I mean, we have producers of content, and usually if you're a producer of content, what we're starting to recognize is that if we can get the money together in a red cam, that we don't need a network, yeah, we exactly. can actually go out on our own, and now you're enabling us to actually get paid for our work on our yeah. own. So I guess this is encouraging um, people to know that they can not only get their value, but if they're starting out right now, they might not have to be a part of the old system. Exactly. That they can be part of the, part of the revolution, part of power to the people. Yeah. Um, if you, um, because you're legal and whatnot and, and have your law degree, but also creative because you're seeing a need, if you were to give content creators a piece of advice today, mm -hmm. to sum this up, what would that advice be? Don't be afraid of being open. You know, because don't uh, be Steve Jobs. No. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, because whether you like it or not, it's go, it, it's going to get copyright. It's going to get pirated. You know, if you, you can try to put up walls and barriers, but rather just embrace, you know, the 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 irresistible force. You know. So just express yourself. Don't be a victim of fear. Yeah. You know, find a way to utilize the forces that are of change that are coming, rather than trying to fight it. You know, because that's very zen. No, but I mean, the music industry provided a cautionary tale because they, they needed did. less bandwidth, and the people who are dealing with fatter pipes, you know, broadband now, television, movies, this is all coming. And whether they've learned the lesson from the music industry or not, we're going to see, right? Great, yeah. Henry. Thank you so much thank today, you, and and thank you guys. I hope that presented a a clear picture of what Creative Commons is about. So, CreativeCommons.org, CreationMix.com. Thank you, thank you, and thanks for the folks back there that made everything run smoothly. Thank you, everyone. Thank you for coming.